So the, the people, the entomologists at the time, they went out, they did a survey, they realized that this insect in some way was associated with the decline of the, the decline in mortality of these trees. And it was to be determined whether it was the causal factor or some contributing factor to something much larger. Like I said, they didn't really know. So they had to get a positive ID on this thing. And so they sent the sample down to, I think, Slovakia. There was a regional expert um, in on Agrilis, uh, the genus there, and his name was uh, Edward Jendek, and I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he got it positively identified to Agrilis planipennis, which is the emerald ash borer. So now we're kind of cooking. Now we kind of know what we're working with. We know that this insect is associated with its ash mortality in some way. We know the species. We know the native range. And so this map kind of depicts the native range of China and East Russia. And then uh, now we can kind of start to, to determine what the severity of this issue is going to be. And so they, they dug up the literature and I want to say like, I'm kind of embarrassed that I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I feel like there had to have been less than a dozen publications specifically addressing a uh, emerald ash borer prior to 2002. And it's since been very prolific. And so they didn't know a whole lot about it because of it in its native range, it wasn't actually killing ash trees. It wasn't killing trees. It wasn't something noticeable. It's what we would call in forest entomology kind of a secondary pest that, get, that requires the tree or the host to be so declining in some way or dying. It's not killing in the native range its host trees. And so the literature pulled together this whole host of potential hosts, right? You'll see some alarming things on here that we now know are not true. But at the time in 2002, we weren't really sure. And so they ended up doing some of these uh, choice, no choice uh, host susceptible or suitability tests. Basically, they exposed the insects to these potential hosts. In this case, they had listed in the records in the archives that almas, elms, juglans, uh, walnuts, and then your fraxinus, your ash trees, were all potential hosts for emerald ash borer. So they did these choice, no choice tests, exposing the insects to these potential hosts to see one, if the adults are attracted to this material, if they are attracted to this material, will they preferentially oviposit or lay eggs in there? And then if they do, can those larvae follow through and complete their life cycle? And so through this research, they were able to very rapidly, this all happened really fast, they were able to determine that in fact, these were not alternate hosts, which is really good news in terms of starting to determine how to manage this, this particular insect, because there's a huge difference between a polyphagous insect or an insect that feeds on a wide range of genre or families even. We've got a few families listed that they initially thought might be associated with it, and then one that's more host-specific and pretty much um, isolated to a single genus, at least a single family, the Oleacea. You'll see white fringe tree is also a potential host, but we're not going to concentrate on that too much. And so with that, there are very, with these host specific insects, there are very specific cues that they have to hone in on, right? The success of their larvae, the success of their progeny depends upon this, this overposition selection, right? Uh, because being whole metabolists or complete metamorphosis, they have the egg, the larval stage, the four instars, and the pupil stage. And so once that egg is laid on the host, the larvae doesn't really have any choice in the matter. It's not going to fly away. It's not going to jump away. It has to be the suitable host, right? And so a lot of these really host-specific insects, uh, they're honing in on very, very specific cues, sights, smells, olfactory cues, right? They're picking up on some of this stuff. And so they were able to kind of narrow this stuff down and these these would be the these would be the ash trees from the native uh, region of Manchurian ash or Chinese ash. And then I also want to elaborate on the type of host. So it's sure the species, but they also had to be susceptible. They also had to be stressed, uh, moderately stressed in some way for these insects to complete a life cycle. So there's a big difference between being yes, it feeds on Manchurian ash, but it won't feed on healthy Manchurian ash. So it has to be stressed in the native range. And then we take all this all the way from over there into here in Kansas. And then the two primary ash species that we're dealing with here in Kansas would be your green and your white ash. And so there's a little bit of uh, uh, difference in, in regard to uh, how these hosts are susceptible compared to their native range. And I want to also note that um, while it was detected in 2002, it was probably introduced sometime in the 90s, right? So they were able to do some really great dendrochronological research and uh, determine that sometime in the early to mid 90s is when, when this thing started to establish. So it takes a while to see. It took them almost a decade probably before they even noticed it. And this will have implications for stuff we're dealing with today, why this is pretty challenging. And so the really the only the trees we're going to be talking about are, are the green white ash here. And so it's really important that you get the, the ID properly. 
And so when they're going through this, so they, they've got the host range, they know that we're pretty much selected to Fraxinus, your ash species. And so it's it's very host specific. And so now they can start trying to determine what 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 cues that insect is, is honing in on, right? And so agrylus, they aren't typically known for being really drawn in by long distance pheromones and things like that, like you think of a bark beetle or even some you know, uh, plant compounds, like you think of Japanese beetle, these traps that draw them in using olfaction. Um, but they looked into that stuff anyway. So they did a bunch of electro antennagram research exposing the leafy green volatiles and kind of landed somewhere in like the, the, the cis-3 hexanol and sesquiterpenes, which basically make up manuka oil. And so they were going to apply this in some fashion to the trapping technique to try to delineate the distribution of this and find out where it was. But more importantly, they were honing in and they're working on this research simultaneously to look at some of the visual cues that these insects are, are, are behaviorally reactive to. And so they found that the males and females were responsive, they were more attracted to things within that UV, that violet, and then that green range. And then interestingly enough, the females actually, uh, their behavior changes after they've been mated and then they hone in a little bit more on some of those red colors and stuff like that. And so that's when they kind of incorporated that into some of these trapping schemes here, where many of you might have seen some of these hanging all throughout Kansas. I hung hundreds of them in the around 2010 to 2012, the big purple panel traps and the greens. And so they're really trying to hone in on this, um, on these colors. And so this was the tool of choice for a while. Um, they had, you know, the manuka oil was, was used in conjunction with that. It's honestly not a very great early detection tool. Um, but it's the best that we had with the information we had at the time. And so this stuff wasn't actually very effective, but we do know that, you know, in the native range, they're preferentially attracted to ash trees that are experiencing some sort of intermediate degree of stress. You know, there's some sort of volatile signature, something going on that we haven't quite characterized completely. And so another survey method is physically just to girdle ash trees in an adjacent to known infest infestation areas and you seem to attract more insects that way. And you can cut the trees down and peel back, look for the, the galleries, the tunneling, stuff like this in the physical larvae. And then sometimes we'll actually attract, attach an adhesive to the outside to maybe intercept some mating adults, which is very, very rarely you can get those. Um, and so with that, you know, they're, they're attracted to these intermediately stressed hosts but it can be difficult in the research to kind of disentangle if that's because they're already colonized and recolonizing those regions. A lot of that data comes from physically looking at the activity of, of the adult beetles and then looking at the crown condition and stuff. So it's kind of, they do, they are slightly attractive. It's really difficult to disentangle some of the nuance of that. So, but this has been one of the more effective kind of measures that we use in music today. I've got dozens of them all throughout the state to try to find it in new areas. Before we move on, do you have any questions about that? That's kind of was all happening really fast in terms of uh, from 2002, you know, they would have already kind of characterized all this by the end of 2003, 2004. Like I said, this was stuff that inspired me. Some people, some people watch sports and, you know, buy the jerseys and stuff. They had jerseys of these researchers. I would, I would have them all hang on. Um, and so we're going to go through some mapping here. And so I did find out when I was putting this thing together last night that it's not complete. There's some counties that are missing. So we're going to cycle through this from 2002 to see how this thing is going. And I want you to be very clear. I want to be very clear that there's a difference between the distribution of something like this and the spread, right? So early on, we detected, you didn't really know where it was, but then you, it's very easy to then look at a map like this, cycle through and watch counties accumulate over time, and then appear that that's how it's spreading, when in reality, you're just mapping the distribution and capturing a little bit of spread. Right, there's a lot of confusion with that. So there's the first few detections. That's 2002, January 2002. I'll go through pretty fast, but it's kind of cool to see, and, and then it'd be easy to see how people can make this mistake. So now we've got a, we've got a little bit better technology. We know what we're dealing with. We're deploying traps. We're getting more. We're getting more people, more workers, physically out in the field looking for this stuff. So here, so it's likely already established in a lot of these ranges. So we're 2005 now graduating high school at that time, 2006. I think I was in Sharon Billings that time, 2007. So you can see it really does appear like it's spreading. You're capturing some spread, but you're also mapping the distribution. Two different things, 2008, 2009, 2010, 
So this is when I was in Kansas. So in 2010, I was in Kansas plant protection and quarantine, deploying traps all over the eastern third of the state to try to find these things. And then also spongy mop, formerly gypsy mop, we were deploying a lot of traps for that too. <coughs> 2011, I think grad school. And then here we go. So there's a lot of missing data in Kansas. I don't know if that's lack on reporting on our end or whatever, but we'll have to we'll have to address that. So this is the first instance of a detection in Kansas. That's Wyandotte County, Wyandotte County Lake, right on the border of Missouri. Uh, you can see here there for several years there was a detection positive detection there in Missouri. So right over the border, they don't like to adhere to our arbitrary municipal boundaries. And so this detection was actually uh, occurred due to visually just seeing uh, a symptomatic tree. It was declining at the lake, called up, called up Kansas Department of Agriculture, Kansas Forest Service, and then people went, cut it down, pulled the larvae out. That was the first detection in Kansas. Then you move on from there, you got Johnson County. I actually set that trap. Believe it or not, we caught a few in traps. It's very rare. Um, that was at a vegetative dump in Johnson County. Um, pretty exciting. Then we moved to Leavenworth County. So you kind of see the pattern of how it all just happens to be right next to each other. There's for several reasons. Uh, Douglas County, 2015, that was really interesting. There was multiple detections, one in Lawrence, Eudora, Clinton Lake, all the same year. We're getting a little bit more efficient with our monitoring. Atchison County, this was the year that APHIS started um, using contractors to deploy traps. This one was caught in a purple panel trap. There were two for like, what is that? Two for five or something, two for six in traps. Donovan County up there in the northeast corner by St. Joe. This is Vendena. I actually found this. I was working with a rural landowner to help him manage his rural, tip, rural timber and just saw a bunch of standing dead ash trees walking around in the woods. So we cut them down, called KDA and found that detection. Just found it, just saw the trees dying. Not much for a while, not until 2018. 2019, we got uh, Jackson County and Miami counties. They're all contiguous, adjacent to one another. Nothing in 2020, probably for reasons not associated with the spread of it, but probably <laughs> lack of activity on our. Mm -hmm. So 2021, the federal quarantine was rescinded in 2021. Right. So there was no there was no proof. So the whole quarantine was never meant to fully eradicate the insect, but it's kind of slow the spread and maybe contain it. And so a lot of the rationale was that it's been spreading. It's been spreading like it didn't fly to, to you know, to Denver or whatever, to Colorado. Um, it was moved to human assisted movement. Um, and so really the, there was no proof that really the quarantines were doing much they weren't effectively slowing it down. I don't really know. There, there's a lot of there's a lot of dispute with that. Intuitively, it seems to make sense that the big players, as we'll see in the next slide, they were playing along and not moving nursery stock. So the quarantine material was ash material, firewood, all hardwood, firewood, nursery stock, all this kind of stuff. So people were moving wood around on a small level, but at the large scale, the big box stores, all this stuff, they quit moving stuff around. Mm -hmm. Then that was rescinded in 2021. And then Incidentally, and I get this picture here in 2022 from a colleague, uh, Tyler Fike. So this is at Home Depot here in Lawrence, Kansas. There were like 30 of these. So that's an autumn purple ash for sale for a whole 40 bucks. You get to watch your tree die in about five years. And so that's not a resistant variety. It's not immune or anything, but they're now selling stock at big box stores. So that's kind of interesting. And then in 2022, we have Brown County detection then Osage County. So this is all still contiguous. I have a hunch it's probably in Wichita and probably in Manhattan. We just haven't found it yet. And so the Osage County was a really interesting detection in that the kind of survey specialist who runs that program for the Kansas Department of Agriculture, her name is Lorinda. She just was riding her horse around and saw a dead ash tree on her property and took it apart. And that was the detection there. So it kind of happens really interestingly. And so that's kind of the bigger pattern. That's kind of the big seminal things that were going on for a while with Emerald Ash Borer. And now I think it's really important that we hone in and get into some finer grain detail to look at what this insect is doing, the damage that it's causing, and then why we actually even care about it, why I care about it, other than the cool people that are involved. And so uh, this, this encompasses all of the life stages. We are missing an instar in that first one, so I apologize. There's four of them, not three. Um, but, you know, this is the general swath of what you're looking at. This is a beautiful, beautiful beetle. 
right? So I actually have a friend who's making a, a goblet uh, out of an ash tree we, we removed together, and he's going to emboss it with a bunch of EAB electra and stuff like that. So I can kind of meditate on this issue like <laughs> conquerors would in the past drinking wine out of the spirit of their language. Um, and so, so, so it's very beautiful. It's a very beautiful insect. I really enjoy it. They don't taste that great. They just kind of taste like wood, but you know, you got to try it. Got it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's hollow metabolis, right? So it, it has a larval stage. And so I always like, this is a generalized, so I've got citations out there. Do you want to read the, this stuff that's in the reference section of that? So this is just a general kind of, this is a general structure of the life cycle throughout the year. So it's, it is, it is univoltine and semivoltine. It has generally it has a one year life cycle, but in some cases it can have a two, it can take two years to develop. And so that two year life cycle is pretty rare. It's sometimes associated with when oviposition occurs later in the season, and then also host vigor, vigor and vitality. There, 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 there are compounds in the trees, the defensive compounds are slowing them down. And so it's some combination of those, those things that's not quite teased out yet. Um, but this is what you're looking at. And so intuitively for me, it's easier to kind of think about when emergence occurs, right? So emergence in Kansas is going to occur mid-May to late May. Definitely after the trees have fully leafed out. Uh, that first emergence is typically about 500 degree days with your minimum being 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so you're getting about 500 degree days, which corresponds with the blooming of something like black locust. So we can have these bio indicators that we see externally in the world to help us determine what's going on internally with these insidious insects like emerald ash borer that you can't really see a lot of their behavior. And so by the time, if you're seeing black locust blooming, then emerald ash borer is starting to emerge. And then peak emergence typically occurs in late June, uh, around 900,000 degree days. Um, What's that mean? So degree days, basically. Yeah. So you'll have your minimum. It's more or less the accumulation of, it simplifies more or less accumulation of days above your certain minimum threshold of 50 degrees. And then you add those up. And it's a good indicator to determine the phenology of insects and plants and stuff like that. Okay. It's more complicated, but, um, but it's a really good, really good uh, thing. And so for the peak emergence, so when the bulk of them are emerging, that's typically associated with stuff like little leaf linden is blooming. Um, some people would say Japanese tree lilac, but that's a huge period where it's flowering. Um, I don't know, like when is cone flower, when is purple cone flower flowering? I know we've got one very July. July. Yeah, so a little later. So you can use these bioindicators to determine this. And so when they emerge, both the males and females, they have to uh, locate healthy ash foliage. And they have to go through this period of what we call maturation feeding, they become sexually mature. It's the last a week and a half, two weeks. The males and females are feeding on the leaves, becoming sexually mature. Once this process is done, they'll move to the to the parts of the tree where mating and overposition occurs. Typically, the females are uh, less mobile, kind of hanging out on the trees more, and then the, the males tend to hover around looking for mates using visual cues to locate those mates. So it's pretty interesting research how they differentiate between sexes and things that are alive and dead and stuff like that. But um, so then the males hover around and find the females, they copulate, and then if all successful, they don't overposit, lay eggs on the bark of the tree, usually in the crevices or underneath the flaps and folds of the bark. So probably is a behavioral adaptation to limit exposure to pred predators and parasitoids and things like that. And so that's kind of the that's kind of the uh, adult life cycle. And then they'll be active pretty much May through August. And so the key takeaway is maturation feeding and then the uh, the leaves have to be on 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 the ash trees for the for them to emerge and to survive. So they have to have that period of maturation feeding. <laughs> And this is not the damaging stage of the, of the insect. And now this is this is the damaging stage. So this is the larval stage. And so once that egg hatches, that first instar, the smallest little instar, burrows beneath the bark of the tree and begins feeding on the cambium layer of the tree. And then uh, in time, so just as a review, I know we've got plant people in here, but just when I'm saying all these things, so this is the area in the red where the larvae are feeding on that cambium layer of the tree. It's that really important tissue that secretes the phloem right out here. It's important in the movement of carbohydrates, and photosynthate stuff accumulates for photosynthesis. 
And then it also secretes the layer to the inside of the sap wood that we typically think of as the rings of the tree. This is the layer, this is where the insect is feeding and then kind of creating this kind of serpentine pattern here. Um, and so as it's feeding in that area, it disrupts a whole lot of different things. And especially in a tree like ash, it's a ring forest tree, which what that means is there's usually more abundance and larger vessels in the spring wood or earlier in the season. And then as the season goes on, that becomes less and smaller. And so you see that really strong demarcation from year to year where we can look at those rings and infer something about the age of that piece of the ring or the conditions, like you can determine the width of those and see if there was some sort of stress associated with, with that tree in time. Um, and so with that, it's also those ring forest trees, especially ash trees, only the outer three rings of that xylem are actively moving material, roughly. 90% of that material being moved is in the outer ring, which is right where the insect is feeding. So early on in the season, those smaller instars, these small ones here, wherever that one went, um, they're not really causing a whole lot of damage. But if you get to the third and fourth instars, they're physically, you can see they're physically getting a lot larger. And then they're really starting to score into that xylem. So you're damaging the cambium, but you're also getting in there and damaging the sap or the vasculature and cutting off the movements of the materials. So one or two of these or a hundred of these uh, galleries on a healthy tree, not really that big of a deal. And so it's density dependent. The more you get, the more disruption of that vasculature occurs and you end up girdling branches of trees and they start to decline. And it's energetically expensive for the tree to respond to this stuff. Right. So they, they have so all of that energy and all of that stuff needs to be applied to some sort of physiological process in that tree, whether it's root elongation establishment, secondary growth, that diameter growth, the rings, uh, primary growth, elongation, foliar production, flower production, fruit production, or defenses. Right. So responding to any emerald ash bowl is very, very energetically expensive. Um, and then so pupation will typically occur early spring. So it's overwintering in that in the, for this one year life cycle, it's overwintering as the fourth instar, they will kind of burrow into the wood a little bit. I'll pass this around. They'll kind of burrow into the sap wood a little bit um, and then create kind of a pre-pupil chamber. They'll kind of curl over on itself in a J shape and then overwinter in that fourth instar, then pupate in the spring and then emerge to the adult. And that's like the whole process. Okay, so you can <laughs> see the discoloration this sample that Bob uh, brought in. Uh, a lot of that dis dis discoloration is response to the to the to the feeding the tree's wound response, and so with this, the patterning of this gallery also can tell you something about the host figure. So when they're doing a lot of those dendrochronological studies to determine when it was established, you can look at the overall pattern of this in in this genus of, of insect of Rylus. In a healthy tree, they tend to be a little bit more compact and uniform. And I think really pretty like this. But as a tree, as the, uh, for whatever reason, if the tree's vigor starts to become compromised, they get more irregular and more kind of serpentine throughout. So you can kind of look at the structure of that. And then depending on how uniform that is, that can tell you something about the condition of that host when the insect colonizes. Really pretty cool. Is that like way too much? Um, any questions about that? We're going to get into some. So that's what's happening in the tree. That's like the damaging stuff that's occurring. And then it's like happening all over the continent right now. Out front, there are a bunch of ash trees out front. In fact, I remember when I worked here, uh, when we were knowing there were some ash trees in the parking lot, and every day I'd kind of look at them. And of course, that was like almost a decade too soon. And so this is what you're going to see. So the feeding behavior and the trick and the in the crown, there's been really a lot of really good research that came out of Michigan and Ohio that they created what we call this crown or canopy ash dieback index. They basically went out, visually looked at trees to determine the visual amount of decline in the crown, cut them down, and they quantified the amount of larvae and damage within those trees. And it's really reliable. I use it every single day. And so this, I love this picture. Uh, I, I should probably have it cited where I got that. I must have lost that somewhere. But I really love it because it shows that gradation from you know, a, a more healthy tree with about 10% thinning all the way down to about half of the tree dying. This is where we make a lot of decisions looking at the crown of these trees. And now there are a lot of other factors determining you know, the overall health of these trees. There's limited soil volume in here and stuff like that. They're parking lot trees, so probably not much you know, value outside. You probably wouldn't want to invest a lot in those. But there are a bunch of considerations there. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail here. 
And so this is a very reliable, I'm not sure what I did up there with that. This is a very reliable uh, thing you can use to kind of go out and look at ash trees in the landscape to determine something about uh, emerald ash borer. So this index basically goes from zero to 100, uh, 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 allocation of zeros is a healthy tree. 100 is dead, it's a dead tree, right? And so basically you start getting to a point where you're about 30% and then those trees sometimes start to go into a decline spiral, right? There, there's not enough connective tissue overall and it's too expensive to put out those epicormic shoots and then it's wasting a lot of energy and then they tend to start to decline. And so your options in terms of what to do with those trees start to get pretty limited. Um, and what's really interesting in this next slide is gonna maybe be kind of sobering for some people um, and so what's really interesting in that 20 to 10% uh, period, you're not seeing branch dieback matter. You're seeing this foliage physically getting, getting stunted. So in ash trees, they have those compound leaves and those leaflets, and then some of the pigmentation is actually, the pigmentation is getting a little uh, more anemic kind of, and then the, the leaflets are physically getting smaller, right? So this is what I use. You kind of, if you, I've looked at literally hundreds of thousands of ash trees. And that's like a really, it, people think you're a wizard when you can just, you know, okay. look at that and see the stunted foliage. If you know something about the leaf expression in a particular region of the ash trees, you can see that difference in the size or pigmentation. It's a really, really good way to determine early on, you know, if emerald ash borer is in that tree. Um, and then, so you're getting to like 30%, you're getting a little bit of this branch dieback. And this has been my personal experience. It's also been quantified. Your average person isn't going to notice this until it's about 40% dead, right? Because all of this stunted foliage, all this damage is occurring. And then you get these latent impacts of dieback, right? So the previous season's damage off this on sometimes occurs visually the following year. And so when I get calls, unless I have like a great arborist, like my pits back there who can do this stuff for me and, and know if the tree is good or not, if somebody's calling me now and more and saying, oh, I think my tree is declining to the emerald ash borer. Uh, can I do anything about it? They're probably somewhere in this region, mostly dead, and there's not much you can do about that. Yeah. What I'm only seeing maybe yeah. 15, 20% of the ash trees that I see in my yes. I yep. prefer the lion, whether it's a piece of coffee or yeah. nothing more. We're, we're getting to a point where we're going to see some cool oh, for this too. Um, so you're getting into this area. So it is basically like an exponential mortality curve in the community. And this pattern is panned out community after community in Kansas, to my knowledge, and then in other places as well. And so what we have here, here is basically you're looking at the years after first infestation, not detection, but infestation. So we're usually not actually detecting this thing until three to five years after it's already been established. It's kind of seething at these sub-detectable levels kind of building up the population, not doing a lot of conspicuous damage. And then by the time we detect it, and so these, then this is kind of what the crowns are going to look like. They're pretty healthy, maybe a little bit of thinning, but nobody's, very few people are noticing this. The curve is still pretty flat. You're not seeing a whole lot of tree mortality. The crowns are kind of starting to lose a little bit more foliage. Um, and then this is where we're detecting this stuff, right? So where people are physically noticing it, or we get lucky and catch it in a trap or something. So you're looking at, look at that curve. I mean, when you get from year eight to year 12, you go from, you know, 15% mortality of your trees in the community to 80%. Like, and it does, it, it's, it pans out community after community after community. So by the time we detect this, it's already rolling, you know. And so a place like Lawrence, that's about when we detected it here, where it was about four or five years after it was first established. And we, I peeled apart a bunch of trees and kind of back traces um, to determine that. And with emerald ash borer, you know, we're not actually talking about extinction of these trees. What we're talking about is a concept called functional extirpation, right? So its role as a large mature tree in the woodlands and our forests and ecosystems, that role is going to shift and going to change. Uh, or its role in an urban landscape as a large shade tree providing all of the benefits of trees, that's going to change but they're not necessarily going to go extinct. They'll keep regenerating and we have a lot of forest data coming out of, you know, the Detroit area where the woodlands, they're continuing to regenerate, get infested, die, live off the seed bank for a while. So they're not going to be going extinct, which is functionally extirpated. And we might have more time, we have time. 
So the functional extirpation. So this, so here's here's some of the other things, the other impacts, right? You have just the basic effects on primary production, nutrient cycle, and all that stuff, water quality, uh, and then you know, wildlife diversity and habitat and stuff like this. Um, and then you get some social political impacts of something like emerald ash. But this thing is huge. Emerald ash borer is a huge deal. And it's just really slow and people kind of forget about it. We need to keep pressure on it. These are all basically things that are that are that are impacted by emerald ash borer. And so one of the things that I've found that I'm working on in the pet project is looking at the impact of emerald ash borer on some arthropods that have some obligate relationship with, with ash trees at some point in their life cycle. So ash borer fields. So Dan Herms and uh, Deb McCullough. Uh, Dan was out of Ohio, and uh, and and uh, uh, Kamal Gandhi was uh, out of Georgia. And so they basically they, they did this really neat study where they they calculated this arthropod this risk of endangerment for these arthropods that are associated with ash trees. They were able to assign a certain level of risk, right? So the more that the particular insect depends on that tree, the higher the risk for them, basically of endangerment once emerald ash borer comes through. And so what, what we're concerned about, what I'm concerned about are those insects that are that allocated with this high risk rate. One such insect group genus is ash bark beetles. This is cute, right? So this is about the size of a grain of rice. You look at these under a microscope and it just makes you all fuzzy inside. And so this, and then this is kind of the behavior that it exhibits beneath the bark of the tree. The white stuff, those are the larvae. And then the big long marks going across the grain, that's the nuptial chambers where the adults go in and oviposit legs, but eggs along the, the, the area of this particular thing. So this is one of the least aggressive bark beetles I've ever worked with in my entire life. It just very rarely is associated with tree mortality. Its habitat is literally dead and dying ash trees. Before EAB, a very common thing that we would see with ash is those low limbs would kind of self prune and they would die back because those compound leaves were casting so much shade. You have a bunch of dead limbs just on the underside, on the bottom of those canopies. This is a habitat where this thing survived. It's not aggressive at all. There have been isolated incidents where it may be associated with drought or something and come in and population can get up and maybe contribute to mortality. But in general, it's not killing the tree. And so one really cool thing, we were able to synthesize uh, lures for this thing and we can catch it because bark beetles are really well known for honing in on these olfactory cues. And so we can actually collect this thing and I'll get into some detail to try that time with that. Um, but I just want to show some more charts and stuff. So this is coming out of some other research you kind of pinned together. Um, you know, just your typical kind of pie chart, looking at those risk of endangerment there, this cambium and phloem feeder. So this is kind of the area um, where these arthropods are going to be at the greatest risk of endangerment because they physically can't survive without the species. And then this is just kind of broken up by feeding again. There's parts of the plant that the insects feed on. And then, uh, then they're also able to kind of uh, model uh, the, the, the hypothesized response to these things, uh, of these insects. And so this one, so this, you just pay attention to more of that bell-shaped curve. And so on the bottom, you have time since invasion of emerald ash borer, and you have the population level of these flown feeders and xylem feeders or ash bark feeders. So like I said, they can't reproduce in perfectly healthy trees. They need dead and dying trees to, to reproduce. And so, so I, I have traps up there. It's a few years, I'll give you an answer to this. It's very, very hard. Um, but what we suspect is that as emerald ash borer moves into an area, it makes the host material available for something like ash bark beetle, right? It's creating that substrate that that can actually reproduce on. It can't kill healthy trees. And so those populations will predict and repredict and, you know, are hypothesized that they're going to go up and they're going to increase pretty spectacularly with the abundance of that coarse woody dead ash material. <laughs> and then once that material depletes, then we're going to see. So we're trying to actually map, see if we can map this. Uh, the potential population change associated with emerald ash borer in ash bark beetle. Is that super confusing or does, does that make sense? Yeah. And so, um, so we can also, so with some of these lures that we, uh, they're a lot easier to find at low level population levels than something like emerald ash borer. So this is the part that I'm kicking myself for, for really honing on. It's really, really difficult to link these things. And so, uh, we can collect ash bark beetles really well with these lures. And so uh, we have a series of traps out throughout the region, throughout the known infested region of emerald ash borer along the fringes where we're monitoring 
continually monitoring the population of the bass bar beetle with these uh, traps, basically. And then uh, and then if we can see some detectable, measurable increases in those trap catches, just we can figure out if in some ways things to ash, it would be linked to ash mortality, but if we can figure out if, what that relationship might be with ammo ash for. So it's uh, a little ambitious, but really interesting, right? So potential indirect early detection methods for something like and ash mortality associated with ammo We'll Ryan, where do you think we are in warrants on your curve? So we're at you know, we're like right here right now, and I think with the next few years we're going to be, you know, like pretty high. So we're, you know, it was detected in 2015. So we're we're right here. It's like going up. Yeah. And so with all of this, it's like a lot of this was kind of inspired. Like this, but like I said, I've been thinking about animal dashboards since 2000. Uh, so even when I was in graduate school, messing around doing stuff with Southern Pine Beetle, all of these relationships were were coming up to my mind with something like ash bark beetle and how emerald ash borer would impact that. And so this is like a well-known study. Is anybody kind of familiar with Southern Pine Beetle and the Pine Beetle bark bark beetle guild and stuff like that? So there's a lot of these delayed density-dependent responses in those communities. So Dendrochthenus frontalis, the Southern Pine Beetle, that's your primary tree killing insect in that region in the south. And then you have all of these other associates with it. And so you have this pretty predictable delayed density dependent response. Emerald or sudden pine beetle comes into a pine stand, causes a lot of mortality, sets the field for the lips beetles and things like that to come in with this delayed density dependent response. And that's kind of what we're thinking we're going to be able to find or, or, or model maybe um, with emerald ash borer. And you can see it with really interesting stuff with the predator the predator response. So the Thanassinus dubius is a clarid beetle in southern pines that's a major predator of southern pine beetle. This stuff pans out over and over again. So in the solid line, that's that's the abundance of that's uh, southern pine beetle. And then you, you get this really predictable response with the predators every time they're honing in on physically on the host, the stressed host, and they're honing in on this the, the pheromones produced by uh, southern pine beetle. And so you get this really Pretty relevant density dependent response, delayed density dependent response. That. So that's just kind of stuff that you, you know they've been able to model with each other things, and maybe they've been able to do that with uh, ash bark wheels. And so that kind of describes what I'm trying to do. Maybe if successful, it'd be kind of neat. Maybe some will care about it, but um, but that's kind of where we're at with this stuff. This ash bark beetle. What one of the challenging things that we've had. Two is uh, with ash bark beetles, you know, we made the lures a little bit too hot in some areas. And so the way by that being very attractive to these insects. And so the way that the forests are in Kansas, they're really non-contiguous and patchy. And so we've actually excellent tracked out ash bark beetles in stands with ash trees. Um, and not not we didn't mean to, but they did they just disappeared and started being caught which is you never hear of that with trapping, but just small, small areas of ash forest and stuff. And so you know, you've got to be careful with that. Um, but anyway, hopefully that wasn't too confusing at the end. I tried to basically in three slides throw a dissertation <laughs> that I'll probably never finish with. Um, and then with that, you know, you can like snap. I can send all this full. So all this stuff is great. Uh, there's research. Um, very small and you can use it so I can send you a copy or whatever. But uh, like I said, so emerald ash borer is just, you know, we need to keep the pressure on it. We need to keep talking about how important it is and we need to keep being responsive because it's not the last thing like this that's going to happen. We don't tend to learn from history, right? We've seen this with, we've seen this with uh, with chestnut blight. We've seen this with, you know, Dutch elm disease. We've seen it with emerald ash borer. We will see it in something else in the future. We don't seem to learn from our mistakes. And so we need to really continue to, to keep pressure on these pertinent issues that are causing economic but ecological damage as well. Right. Well, that was a whole yeah. Really nice talk. Thank you. I learned a lot. Um, I think you said PAB in its native range infests um, dead and dying trees or spread trees, but it can infest healthy trees. Yeah. Here. So what what's going on there? So it's likely a host chemistry issue. So the whole I didn't get into biology to control as much, but it's cool research going on with that right now. But likely the driving factor is host chemistry. 
So they looked at some stuff, some uh, jasmonic acid compounds and things like that that are play some sort of role in the host defense or okay. attractiveness yep. of uh, Emerald Ash Borer to its native like Manchuria and yep. Um So it's more of a, a host defense and chemistry yep. issue um, that they just don't have. It's, it's not, so it's not a top, necessarily a top down predator prey parasitoid driven thing like a host host suitability or host chemistry and things like that. I can get you some links, but it's really interesting. But, uh, Helen? Um, so the forward to the issue that I think I've heard this, but are they like zero ash? They have, I'm sure people have studied what is left of the ash and what is coming in. Uh, yeah, so that's a really interesting story. So there was conjecture early on that once Emerald Ash Borer comes through an area of host material, will recruit in a population of one. Uh, that didn't pan out to be the case in the Detroit area so far. There was a significant seed bank regenerating. Um, so they've been able to persist at least for 20 years. Now, um, in terms of is that sustainable, is that seed bank from the previous, you know, dominant canopy, and then will that be able to perpetuate after a few cycles of BAB? Uh, maybe, probably, you know, we're seeing that, you know, in some cases, those trees will reproduce before they succumb to animal ash borer. So, so it's, it's complicated. Like right now, if you just looked at the snapshot, you'd say it's going to continue regenerating. But there is that there is that question mark about the the seed bank that was already in in this in on the site before animal ash borer. And I mean, it's not long lived seeds, so um, we're probably going to learn that here in the next decade, decade and a half. What's going on with there? But for for our purposes, we've got another twenty years before we're going to see. And and I assume it's honeysuckles and what what are the opportunistic trees that are so it depends. <laughs> yeah, so it depends what's there. And so Kathleen Knight of Northern Research Station, she, she did a lot of really great research with this. And so anecdotally, I've seen where honeysuckle is present, and you get ash decline. They tend to regenerate much more quickly in those pockets. They tried to quantify this, and it didn't really. <laughs> It's, it's difficult. So it's got to be there. Um, but, but the thing to remember about the ash decline is that it's a very slow process. It's a few years, especially early on in the infestation, it takes several years. Now, once the density of beetles gets up, the population gets up, they can crash in a year or two. But it's taking several years. So, so silviculturally, those, those crowns are dying very slowly, slowly letting you know, sunlight into the forest floor. And so that's going to tend to favor more shade in shade tolerant species as opposed to releasing the canopy for oaks or hickories or something like that. So I've personally seen it seems to, the, the decline seems to in areas where honeysuckle is located favor that because it's there, but I don't know that the data pans out on a huge number. Yeah. So we've got a whole pile of data from your trellis. Mm -hmm. And is there a really good way of Telling the emerald ash borer from our native grills. Yeah, so there's one. Um, there, there is another agrilis that that is associated. Gosh, the species is, is debating me right now, but it is associated with ash trees, but only that it will not colonize healthy ash trees. And it's significantly smaller. So they've they've done some comparisons. So for surveys and things, you know, we've got keys where we can basically differentiate between, but you're not going to see, you know, our native agrilis tunneling perfectly healthy ash trees. So that's a good, so now later in the infestation, you might get some confusion, uh, but the, the instars are much smaller. They're, they're what about adults? adults? So the adults, yeah, those are pretty, it's pretty foolproof identification of emerald ash borer. So the adults of, the species is debating me, but the adults of that particular species that they did these comparative analyses with are smaller, but they also look, they look different too. So, you know, the, the external diagnostic characteristics of the emerald ash borer adults are pretty, pretty distinctive, right? Yes. With, with the uh, loss of the American elm, um, I, I thought back then that uh, urban foresters were recommending uh, elm replacement with ash. Yep, that's the story. Yeah. Urban yeah. Fire yeah. And so currently, people and are- What do I get now? My cousin, hey. <laughs> right, yeah. And so currently they're largely replacing <laughs> ash with maples, right? So it's one of the most specious, you know, genre in China and it's where you import a lot of this stuff. And so if I were a betting person, I'm not, if I were a betting person, you know, it could be anything, it'd be like a talpa, this next thing that we're gonna get. If I were a betting person, 
odds are there that it's going to be something you may want to do. Yes, and in that same vein, so loss of ash in urban environments is losing a free uh, environment that's pretty much treeless or tree limited. Um, but in a but in a for in a natural forest situation, is ash ever dominant? There's some area, you know, some bottom lines and things like that. It'll be a fairly, fairly large component of the dominant canopy. And, uh, you know, I don't necessarily, there are some, it depends. It's so heterogeneous here in Kansas, like the forest types are so different. Um, but it, it is a major component of several forest types, usually kind of in the bottoms and stuff. Yeah, because I was wondering how much the ash species have been moved around outside of its native range. Or the part of the yeah, we're in it. Yeah, we're in it. So. And in terms of the urban trees, a lot of that um, impact is is in terms of risk and safety. So they tend to once those trees start to die, they tend to fall apart pretty rapidly. There's a whole host of different types of decay fungi that get in there, you know, basically deteriorating the ling lignin and cellulose, and then they start to fall apart and create risk for, you know, we 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 don't even have people climb the EAE trees at all anymore. Basically, their whole ordinance is against that in certain communities because so many trees. So it's more of a safety. Yeah, Joe. Uh, so here at KU, it's it's going to be a serious problem. It's going to be a problem in Lawrence. Um, I know communities are stretched really thin in terms of supporting their their urban forests already really thin, and they, yet they're mobilizing so many resources to deal with this one specific problem. What are communities doing to be able to get those dollars to deal with this? And then how can we learn from that here at KU so that we're going to have the dollars that we need to deal with the trees that are all over this campus that's going to have very well. Yeah. And so I think it, with this in Kansas, it varies from community to community, their response to handle that before. Honestly, if you get further west, people tend to wait on it a little bit longer. Um, you know, places like Lawrence that's going to be pretty proactive. You know, it wasn't too difficult to persuade, you know, some resources to address that in some way. Um, and just because of the community, the way the community operates. Um, now at KU, I think, you know, it's definitely just quantifying the economics, the money, right? Like people, you know, people tend to care more about the money stuff. And so linking that to whatever your sunk cost is on campus, the sunk cost for whether it be treatment or removal, then the perceived risk of those trees if they fail around the building or classes or, or the sidewalk. And so that would be the language that you'll need, you'll need to speak would be, you know, how it impacts the pocket that you're in, in safety. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. That little distribution map or detection movie. Can you emphasize that when counties in Michigan start appearing, but that's when they were detected, not necessarily the yeah. spread. And I, I noticed Van Buren County in Southwest Michigan it popped up 2006, maybe. Yeah. So some of that spread, yeah. but for the most, but this is really early on. Here, so yeah. Three years. So that like all of this, that's why I really wanted to talk about the research. They didn't know anything. There was like nothing known, very little known about this insect. You know, and they had to like figure this stuff out like fast, and so it was spreading. But most of this, I wager, it was probably already established. Yeah, because in Van Buren County, we have property. We have eleven huge white ash, and we noticed them looking bad, like two thousand three or four. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of the places where it hadn't been detected, it was well established. It's just a matter of catching up with detection. Yeah, because it was. I mean, so it's. You know, when they determined when it was probably introduced uh, in the 90s, I mean, it was almost a decade or more before they did it, before they knew what, what to do, what to do about it. And so there was a fast declining, you know, because a lot of times it'll get put off on environmental stress or drought or something like that, which is a key component to tree decline. But, you know, very rarely, that's what's so cool about this, very rarely is insect and insect alone causing this kind of tree mortality. It's usually associated with pathogens. Yeah. So this is, this is weird. That's why it's so pretty. And so, yeah, I imagine here you're probably starting to get some spread, but it's also as these as these communities, as these different states were getting adjusted to this, they were getting their program, their survey programs online, federally and statewide. So you physically then have more resources, you know, 
being pumped to this. And so I'd never wish for something like this to happen again, but it would be neat to be in the midst of this stuff in the heyday when it's all unfolding, getting the resources, the funding to research it. But, um, but yeah, so you're getting some spread. And then this one in Denver, you know, that definitely human assisted. And then the most recent one, do they have it? Oregon. Uh, that is a ridiculous, that's a huge, like that, somebody messed up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we'll stop there. Uh, let's thank Ryan again. I think he's also going to be able to hang out uh, after if other people want to meet with him. So thanks. Oh,